Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us today to learn more about planning for a return to in-person um, learning for preschool students and students served in special education intensive service pathways. And a special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Rachel Black, for supporting today's event. This event is being recorded so we can share with families who were not able to join this meeting today. I just want to start. Um, there's actually some breaking news like it just just broke um, just moments ago. We heard that the gov that Governor Inslee will be adding educators and licensed child care workers to Washington's phase 1B1 of vaccinations immediately. So we're super excited to hear that news. Um, as we have been advocating to prioritize vaccination for educators in our in person um, planning. And so that's great news. Um, and so we look forward to seeing what that plan is and what the rollout may be. Um, we at Seattle Public Schools believe in educational justice, and that is our job to help students succeed. And for Seattle Public School students in special education intensive pathways and preschool, that means returning to in-person school now um, in ways that keep students and staff safe. We believe that returning these students to in-person learning is essential for their well-being to receive the mental health services, social, emotional and academic supports that they urgently need. It is our ethical, instructional and legal responsibility to prioritize these students for a return to in-person learning. As we shared last week, the Seattle School Board recently approved a resolution that categorizes the work of supporting students served in general education preschool classrooms and pre-K-12 special education intensive service pathways as essential. This is in alignment with our memorandum of understanding with the Seattle Education Association that was approved by the board last August. This means that preschool students and general education classrooms can return to buildings on March 11th and students served in pre-K through 12th grade special education intensive service pathways will return in phases starting March 11th. Staff supporting these students will return to their classrooms on March 8th to prepare for in-person instruction. And staff have been working tirelessly for months to make sure our classrooms are ready for students. And I know that some families may be feeling anxious about what this return means. Many of you have questions and we're here today to um, start answering them. I'm joined by Chief of Student Support Services, Dr. Consi Pedroza, Director of Early Learning, Heather Brown, and Director of Student Support Services, Dr. Carrie Nicholson. Um, before I pass it over to them, I do want to share the top 10 things families should know about the return to in-person learning. First, there will be a required daily health screening. The screening must be submitted prior to 7 a.m. Um, if not, I mean, I believe that there will also be a sign up at schools um, and families will receive an approved or not approved um, notice. Number two, students will be required to wear a mask. Masks should fit above the nose and below the chin. Masks will be worn on the bus and in schools, except for when students are eating or drinking. If a student does not have a mask, one will be provided. And plexiglass barriers have been installed and advanced PPE ordered for specialized and preschool classrooms for students who are not able to wear a mask. I just saw the PPE bins that are heading out to schools. Um, this week and I was also in schools Friday looking at uh, all the things that are set up and so um, it was great to see um, things are ready and we'll be ready for our return for students. Three, one student will be assigned to each each bus seat um, on the bus unless from the same household. Windows will be open or adjusted to provide airflow. Bus drivers will wear labor and industries approved personal protective equipment, PPE, such as a mask, and um, they will sanitize high touch areas between each route. The entire bus will be sanitized daily after the last run. Number four, all students will be met by staff at a designated drop off area. The daily required health screening will be confirmed at that point. 
um, if a health screening is not complete, the family will attest at the school site or be contacted and the student will remain in a separate waiting area until that is completed. Students will remain masked and six feet apart at all times. Number five, all classrooms are 15 students or less. These small groups or cohorts will stay together all day, including at lunch and recess. Student cohorts have designated entrances, exits, and restrooms. Students with a confirmed health screening will proceed through the designated entrance. Number six, in the classroom, students will be assigned to seats that are six feet apart and face the same direction. As I said Friday, I was in schools um, seeing all this is getting was set up. There's plexiglass in place. We do have a few, uh, we do have some special education um, students um, in person learning right now. And so I saw a few of those students. Um, so things are happening. Arts and physical education we will be provided through a combination of remote and asynchronous learning. Students receiving in-person intensive special education services will have access to general education content remotely with support from their teacher. Um, classroom entrance and release times will be staggered. Number seven, students um, will have their own learning materials for daily use and items will not be shared. Items coming back and forth from school to home will be limited. Number eight, hand washing will be prioritized throughout the day, including but not limited to upon arrival, before lunch, after recess, and after using the restroom. Hand washing signage will be posted throughout the building. Number nine, Daily cleaning of common areas will be done in compliance with CDC and public health recommendations. High touch areas and restrooms will be cleaned three times a day. And additional PPE will be provided in every classroom for daily use. If there is a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19, SPS will follow the CDC cleaning and disinfecting guidelines, contact tracing and communication protocols. Number 10, when heading home, Students will line up maintaining six feet between them. Students will load or be picked up at a designated area. Throughout the district's response to COVID-19, the health and safety of our students, staff, and families have been our top priority. These health and safety protocols were made by our school nurses in alignment with CDC and public health guidelines. And I just wanna take a second to thank our amazing nurses who have done heroic work um, and their hard work in getting our schools ready. Um, they are just phenomenal. Um, I'll now pass it over to Dr. Pedroza, Dr. Nicholson, and Director Brown to share more details about what in-person learning will look like for students. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Conti Pedroza. I'm the Chief of Student Support Services. I oversee uh, the, one of the, my departments is the Department of Special Education. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Good afternoon, preschool families. My name is Heather Brown. I'm the Director of Early Learning and I oversee all the preschool programming in the district. That includes Head Start, Seattle Preschool Programming, the PLUS Programming, and our Developmental Preschool. Hi, my name is Carrie Nicholson. I'm Interim Director of Health Policy Procedures and Practices. My role really is essential to um, synthesize the knowledge to um, develop protocols and procedures that align with our state and local health officials. Um, I regularly communicate with public health in Seattle and King County and in partnership um, and in collaboration, as um, Superintendent Juno just mentioned, um, our amazing school nurses who are helping support the implementation of the protocols, the health and safety protocols. So a few other things, um, will there be more funding or will there be funding for more counselors to support SEL needs for students? Well, right now I can just speak for what we're talking about right now. One of our goals is we are looking at some behavioral supports for staff, um, especially with our special education programming. What does that look like um, in terms of current funding? We do have extra staff currently in place currently right now, and we're making sure that we um, support the, the social emotional needs with our teaching staff in place. Um, we understand um, that it's going to be a new learning for everybody. 
So we are really supporting um, that everybody actually work on building new routines, building relationships, all of the things that really matter um, as people are getting to know each other and understand the new processes in place. All of that will be really important as we launch in person. Great, and there's um, like what preparation will there be for students who have never been to school before? Um, you know, they had to start out remotely. They haven't been in a building. Um, I know that's been really, I mean, that's heart wrenching and also um, so, so exciting about um, coming back into buildings. So, so what kind of preparations been there for those students um, that will be rolling back into buildings for the first time? For our youngest learners, for those who haven't been in buildings yet, and you are correct, Superintendent Juno. Oh my goodness, what an opportunity to get our students back into the building. So there will be a lot of like the first week of school where teachers are really going to start to lean in and teach routines and procedures that really, really are aligned with our health and safety protocols. So how do you learn how to be in school while adhering to the health and safety protocols? We are working with teachers to develop lessons on how to um, have kids wear masks, how to stay six feet apart, how to engage in a play routine and building language supports um, when students have to be um, at a distance. And so all of that will really um, be part of our lessons and our routines. Also prior to um, coming back in, we'll ensure that our lessons um, in remote are um, engaging in this kind of um, teaching and learning for students. Um, and I would add that this, it'd be similar for our special education students, especially as they, they, they're they going to need to learn how to manage those masks and do all of the things. So it'll be similar routines that need to be taught and supported. It's new for everybody, staff, students, everybody. So it'll be a lot of working together and rebuilding those routines and new systems in the classrooms. And then Carrie, maybe you can give a little update about PPE and um, what people can expect will be present and then if there's contingency plans if things run low and how that system might work. Yeah, there's been a lot of questions around um, PPE and I think it's important to understand um, that we do have processes in places right now currently, right? We are serving students currently. Um, so we've developed systems using LNI for staff to determine levels or, of PPE. And right now, um, as you mentioned earlier, that we already have stock for students that we're serving now, and then we're sending out additional PPE for those that we're planning on phasing in. So PPE, again, um, will, is based on the uh, risk of transmission or the task that, some, that the staff member is performing. And we have, um, we're shipping out right now for having at least six weeks available at the building. Um, so that'll be out there with um, a 90 day supply actually that will be able to continually um, resupply what is at the building level. Um, the building level nurse is available also to consult with staff who have questions about PPE. They're reordering places, um, systems in place at the building level to do that. Um, LNI also has guidance um, for what they would say is equivalent PPE. Um, so we are well stocked for PPE for the staff that we have um, coming back to serve all our students. Um, I have no concern about having um, the amount of PPE there. Yeah, I like I said, I saw the PPE sort of getting all packaged up today. Yeah. I believe the district has spent about a million dollars in PPE for our educators and our staff who are out in schools. And so um, it was really nice to see a lot of that already in place in schools and uh, more more coming. Um, how will um, students receive speech, occupational and physical therapy virtually or in person? That'll depend on the, the, the schools, right? Each school and each student in the, in the program. Um, so if for some students, it might be uh, remote. It might be done through remotely through the student will be there all day long. Um, so just like some of the general education access for the students, 
um, maybe even some of the specialists, for example, PE and art. So some of that will still might happen remotely, um, but the students and then the special education teachers and staff will be there to support. Some of the uh, ESA, some of the speech and OTs might be in person as well, and it depends on the, the support that the student needs uh, in, in that space. So it'll depend on the school team and they will be communicating what that schedule might look like. And then um, I know there was a news article recently. Can you just speak to what happens? Um, what about special education students who cannot or will not wear a mask? I'm going to um, pass that to Carrie to answer. Yeah, and, and maybe we can uh, you can speak to it as far as um, the laws around um, um, providing services for students and I'll speak to the health and the safety of um, for those when students aren't able to tolerate a mask, whether it's for medical reasons or for a developmental disability or a disability, um, we layer in other mitigating measures. So we will have staff will wear enhanced level of PPE. Um, so and as well as there's other things that we can do in the classroom sometimes and it depends on the service that's being delivered or the uniqueness of the classroom. There can be plexiglass barriers, right? Um, we can do um, different um, layouts in the classroom itself and we have great ventilation that is actually is an additional mitigation me uh, measure whether that's windows opening um, all those things that we are doing are additional layers of mitigation yeah and we'll just talk about our legal obligation to provide fate for our students i think that's really important to remember um, and also as part of the iep team families are part of that process as well as their medical providers so if there's unique circumstances for a student a medical need for something then we would of course for some of those students consult with the medical providers as well uh, health plans are just as important in this process every student's medical situation is different and we will take all of that and, and coordinate and collaborate with our families and medical providers to make sure that we're really clear and understand the unique situation of every student. And then we will work with our health team to provide the proper mitigating support that is needed at the school and classroom level. And we know at the preschool level that students are not always re are not required to wear masks. They're encouraged to wear masks. So again, I'll reiterate that we're going to do a lot of teaching and learning around how to wear masks and also uh, that our preschool programs will have the enhanced PPE and also working individually with school teams to make sure that we do that social distancing. Yeah, there's a lot that uh, children can learn in school and I think that's going to be a big step, the routines and the things. I mean, I remember back way back when, uh, when we were still in buildings and just the enhanced hand washing that had to happen. And when I was visiting schools, I mean, students were on it, right? They knew to sing the happy birthday song or the 20 seconds and so They'll be quick to pick it up, I think, in a school setting about all the protocols that need to be in place. And then Carrie, I think it was important you mentioned that we already have students in schools, that we've had our child care providers in schools, that there our processes and protocols have been in place and have been being followed. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll just add um, Superintendent Juno and just uh, follow up with what a, a Director Nicholson has said that we currently have 46 school sites that actually are following all of the health and safety protocols. I think that's really important. It's it's an it's it, it it's just it really honors the work that our teachers and staff and our nursing staff have done um, since the summer. And so I just want to make sure we really honor that work. Um, but those are those places have already been um, supporting the the health protocols in place. And there's a question about like, you know, I mentioned about students returning in phases. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yes, we actually are starting to bring in students in phases. The first phase that we have is the preschool and the focus classroom. So that is the first phase. Um, the, the date we've started is for, for bringing those students in for students and families would be March 11th. So communication will be going out uh, from the school site to, to let families know when exactly some of the information around uh, trainings and so forth, what to expect coming into the building. Um, so that's set to come forth, but March 11th is that date. 
follow up by that. All of the other uh, intensive services will be followed up. I don't have all the dates with me. I'll get them for you right now, but it's really important to know that we will be phasing this in over time. And with each uh, service pathway, um, school teams and our staff will be notifying families through each phase and through each step because there is a training needed for families and students. There's trainings needed for staff. Um, staffing needs to be sorted and, and we need to support staff in, in working out the remote learning and the uh, synchronous and asynchronous um, uh, decisions around how that will happen for students in those in those settings. Heather, do you have anything to add? Um, so preschool is part of that first um, March uh, 11th return and uh, along with the elementary focus and that includes all of our programs Head Start, SPP and Developmental Preschool. We are in our programs following um, schedules that are aligned with the general overall district. So if your program was half day before, you will be half day and if your program was full day, you will be full day. Great. Um, what is the plan for, I know we have a lot of process and protocols in place and we've been using them um, with um, the programs that are currently in our schools. Um, can you, Carrie, speak to a little bit about what is the plan um, for notifying families if there is a COVID exposure? Yeah, so, um, it, so in a COVID exposure different than um, at their individual schools. So we're gonna protect student and, and staff confidentiality. So, but when a student is impacted, if it happens to be in their cohort or their classroom, um, we will be in communication with anybody that would be identified as being a close contact. Um, a shout out to the school nurses again, who have been doing and supporting this contact tracing work in um, collaboration with public health. So we, I feel very confident in the work that's been ongoing for this duration and how we are have systems in place for identifying cases as well as following up on contacts. Additionally, we have communication systems centrally in place to inform families um, as well as anybody that would be identified as a close contact. And we are working um, to make some of that um, data more available um, regionally um, for um, on our website. Great. Um, there's a question about, you know, I know we kind of uh, implied or inferred, I mean, whatever, about a way to, about we have a certain number of staff, a certain number of students, we have a certain percentage of students who want to return. And so what's that matching of educator to child look like and um, you know the question is will um, can they be guaranteed to have the same teacher they currently have i can speak for i can speak for special education in terms of that so what we're thinking of for special education is a as an approach of um, the pathways correct um so so that includes instructional assistants, ESAs, that includes teachers. And so it'll, it's a team approach, right, for the students. So we're looking at really a team approach for the student. And so it might be that there might be some teachers that need to take a remote assignment uh, for that team, uh, right? And that's important because we have some staff that have some health and accommodation needs. And so we really want to make sure we honor that. So we're taking a team approach with that. So it might mean like, if, for example, one of their teacher, direct teachers might not be the teacher in person, but that might be the teacher doing the remote instruction for that for that group of students. It's meant to be flexible. Yeah. Um, it's, oh, go ahead. I was going to say it's nice that we have preschool and special ed programs that have multiple staff and teachers in one classroom. So really it is a team approach and especially when you have one or more of the same kinds of programs in a building. So really we're encouraging staff to look across the programs and departments and work together collaboratively. If you have a certain number of students and families that have said they would like to return and then you have um, and you have this many kids to serve in person or this many kids to serve remotely. So it is a team approach uh, and we are really going to try as hard as we can to have kids remain with familiar adults. Uh, that includes instructional assistants, classroom assistants um, and other team members. Great and there's a specific question for you Heather about um, 
what days and times general education preschool will be? Sure, that is our SPP or our Head Start program. And so those will be those two programs. If you're full day, you will align um, with our full day programming, which will be four days a week. Right now, no uh, in person on Wednesdays. Half day programming, developmental preschool, you will be part day. And so we're really looking at um, hopefully having an AM session be the in person session, depending on the numbers of an in um, in building and so those developmental preschool kids will be able to then have a the the classroom will have a PM session will be remote. I'll add for intensive services. It's four days a week as well. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, full day that models the the regular schedule currently happening and then no uh, live uh, in person instruction on Wednesdays. Yeah, great. And I think that alignment is going to be important. I think for families that are adjusting to a new way of uh, of how it's all going to work. I guess um, there's a question about like, what about students that have one on ones? Um, so if a student has selected in person and they're coming into the building, then that one on one is also the staff that will be coming in person. So all staff uh, related to the services, the students coming in person would report to the building. So those that would follow. Yeah, and then there's a question about will parents be able to walk their children into the classroom? Yeah, unfortunately not at this time, but soon, right? Like we we hope, but right now, no. What we have to do is, is really follow the health and safety guidelines that mitigate any risk for transmission. And, and so therefore um, students will be met at the entry, at the entryway with their, their teacher. So um, no, not yet, but um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to see that and um, have families be able to more normal routines that we're used to. Yeah, um, and the, there's a question about what what does enhanced PPE mean? Yeah, that's a good question. We're using that word as more layman, but it's just beyond that cloth face covering, right? So we're all used to doing that universal cloth face covering or face mask. Um, enhanced just means to layer or put more PPE on. For instance, that could be, for example, instead of a cloth face covering, that would be maybe a surgical mask and a face shield. Um, additional PPE for staff who might be having closer proximity um, with students, depending on um, what they're doing with the student. That could even be a gown or even higher levels of, of a type of mask, like an N95 or an N95. So again, following LNI guidance um, for the task that is being performed. Great, and then there's a question of like about transportation, like bus schedules and how, how do they, how will they know what their transportation schedule is? Um, we've been coordinating with transportation from the very beginning. And so transportation will be notifying families uh, just like the normal process that we do in the start of the school year. They'll be getting notifications through from the transportation department, letting them know of the transportation that's um, for students coming into the buildings and their start dates and the locations and all of that. Many of our students will receive door to door transportation, so they'll be getting that information as well. Great, um, and then there's the final question of just, I guess not final, but there is a question about how does a person, how would a family change the decision that they submitted on their survey? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, so I, I will talk about the survey just a little bit. When you select it in person, we have all of that in a central database. We've done all of that when we followed up with families. We use that uh, central database to follow up and make sure we mark everything accordingly. There is an opportunity if, if your circumstance has changed uh, since that time and you decided to, to not come in person, um, it, we've sent a notification letter to you uh, Friday night letting you know that you indicated that you wanted in-person instruction. And so the process is that you follow up with your school principal. Your school principal has access to that same database that we talked about. They can go into the power schools and they can change your selection. And then that information will be come downtown. So our central office staff can follow up and make sure that we've coordinated the nutrition, the transportation, all of those other pieces. But your principal would be the point of contact. Um, the school, the principal, the assistant principals and the office um, admin have access to that information and we will have access to it as well. So please notify your principal if your circumstances have changed. 
Awesome. So we're out of time. These always go so quickly. And just thank you again for joining us. Um, today's event was focused on answering questions from our families of preschool students and students served in special education intensive service pathways. However, we will be sharing a recording of this meeting more broadly in our School Beat newsletter, on our social media channels, and on our website. So if we weren't able to answer your question today, please reach out through the Let's Talk feature on our website. You simply go to the seattleschools.org and click the orange contact central office button. Um, the appropriate staff person will work to get back to you as soon as possible. If you have specific questions about your school building, please contact your school's principal. Principals will be sharing each building's HVAC and planning updates with their communities over the next few days. Finally, we recognize that some families may not be ready to return students to classrooms. All students have the option to continue in the 100% remote learning model for the remainder of the school year. Our goal is to make sure families have the information they need to make decisions that best meet the needs of their child and their family. In January, families were asked to select an instructional model of 100% remote or in-person. Um, and as you heard Dr. Pedroza just talk about, um, there are there are ways to change your selection and um, we'll continue to update that as well um, later in the week. And so thank you um, for being here and um, helping our families get a few of their questions answered. I know that we're all excited um, for next week and, and what it holds. Um, I was recently, uh, I have a friend over in the Bremerton area in Kitsap County and their children went back to in-person learning and it was pretty phenomenal both for the family and the children to be back in person. And, um, and so, I know that there are a lot of people looking forward to it. And so thank you for all the work on the back end to make sure that this is happening um, and look forward to next week. And thank you again for being here and we'll, um, we'll you'll be hearing more from us. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.